Changing the fuel filter is pretty straightforward, so long as the fuel tank is empty. So mine was about half full, so I have already cracked open this flange where the fuel pump and filter are housed to drain off all of the gas. So now my tank is empty. Now all we have to do is undo all these screws and pull the assembly out. So here's the filter right there. You can see that it is held to the fuel hoses with these clamps. And I'm going to be replacing these with proper fuel hose clamps that have screws in them so that you can take them on and off a lot easier. Alright, so that has all new hose clamps on and the fuel filter in. Now I would recommend if you're looking to do this, get some 10 millimeter fuel injection hose clamps. I didn't get some that small, but it should work. This one's a 11 to 13 millimeter one. And these ones are larger at 13 to 15 millimeters. So just a little bit of a tip there. Anyway, this should work, should hold the fuel pressure just fine. Then the final part of this fuel filter replacement is replacing the O-ring gasket that seals the fuel pump flange to the tank. I've got a new one of these. These are kind of pricey things. I think I paid about $12 for this O-ring, but it's a Viton O-ring and it fits perfectly to this flange. See how this one's kind of flattened out a bit. So I'm going to put some Vaseline on it so it'll seal up even better.
I will note one thing, I did try to install the fairings already and the battery cable, at least the way I had it routed, wouldn't allow the fairing to sit properly against the battery. So I've actually had to reroute the cable to go around this fuse. So if you're upgrading to this thicker diameter battery cable, make sure you route it behind the fuse and not in front of it and dangling down here because they're just a little bit long and the fairings can't be installed that way. All right, let's look at something that I didn't get on video because I didn't think I would actually be able to do it successfully. And that is resetting the service light. So you notice when I turn on the key, I'm not immediately presented with a serve word that would read across the dash right there. It used to do it. In fact, go back to my first video. When I turn on the key, you'll see it says serve right there. Now it doesn't because I've reset the service light. And how I did that was firstly locating the diagnostic port, which is right here under the battery. It's just this little wire that's hanging freely. It's got a cap on it. You remove that cap and you hook up a cable, a special cable over here. And I'll put links to all of these items in the description of the video. And this goes into the diagnostic port on the bike. These alligator clips you hook up to the battery terminals. You'll also want to make sure the polarity of these are correct. I'll put a link in the description as well on how to determine that. And on the other end of this is an OBD2 port, and then you'll need a Bluetooth OBD2 um, unit like this, and you'll hook this up with your phone through Bluetooth. And basically, when you have all this connected to the bike, then your phone will be able to connect to the bike's computer, basically. And if you have an Android device, there's a app on the App Store that allows you to reset the service light on this. The app works a little finicky, but it does end up working in the end. One of the little quirks of the app is when you're actually linking up your Bluetooth device to the app, sometimes it says it didn't successfully connect, then it says it did successfully connect, and you just gotta kinda keep trying until you get it to hook up. But basically, it's really simple. Once you get to that point, you turn the bike's ignition on, it says that it can read the bike. Then you hit reset service light, and boom, it's done. And you know, these adapters come out to be about 50 bucks, but then every time that service light comes on, basically every time the bike thinks it needs an oil change, you can just reset it yourself. You don't have to worry about taking it to the Ducati dealer and getting a bill for like 200 bucks just so they can reset the light for you. So I'll put links to all these things in the video so you can do it yourself if you have an 1198 or similar. Those are the fairings installed. And wow, this bike looks amazing. It looks so good, it's so clean underneath, but the fairings really made the whole thing pop. You can see this bottom fairing has been replaced with that used panel I found on eBay. And it's got a couple little scratches here and there, but man, it is a lot better than the one I took off there. It just looks basically perfect now. See the touch up? Well, you can't even hardly see where I touched up the paint. I put a layer of clear coat on there looks really nice now you gotta really start hunting for those imperfections now now we're not done here there's a few more convenience things that I want to do to this bike the first being dealing with this windscreen so the stock windscreen is fairly worthless it doesn't really protect you from wind in any way especially when you're not in the tucked position Yes, it's a race bike, it's supposed to be low, but I wanna make this bike as usable on the street and as user-friendly on the street as possible, so I'm going to be swapping this out for a taller screen, and the one I decided to go with is made by Zero Gravity. It's a sport touring screen, they call it, and it's like two and a half inches taller than stock. Not exactly inexpensive. All in after shipping, it was like 130 bucks, so I hope it makes a difference when riding around. So let's get this fit it on the bike. And there we are. I personally think that looks awesome. I know a lot of 
Ducati purists will say that looks a little frumpy or not nearly as sleek as the original one, but you know what? I think it gives it a sort of endurance bike look and it makes it leagues more practical to actually ride around town. It takes a ton of air off your chest when you're just cruising around. So I like this quite a lot and it's easier to get into the tuck position behind a screen like this. So I think that's definitely money well spent. Now we're not done practifying this bike and one more thing we're going to do in that regard is add a tank bag mount to this tank. So this tank is not steel so you can't just stick a magnetic tank bag. You have to get a special ring made by GV to mount a GV tank bag on here. Now I already have a GV tank bag because I got it a long while ago when I had a Triumph with a fiberglass tank and I had to get some way to mount a tank bag to it and this was how I decided to go to it. And we've got the mount over here. It comes in this little container. It consists of a metal ring that bolts down top a plastic ring. And this is what the actual tank bag latches onto. And it also comes with some mounting hardware, some longer bolts that go into that fuel filler cap and a little protection ring that you put down on top of the gas tank so that this doesn't scratch up the paint. So pretty simple to install and it'll make this bike leagues more usable because you can carry a little bit of luggage anywhere you go. Perfect. Now the last thing to do on this bike is a practical addition and that is adding a rear hugger to the swing arm. And I can't tell you how much time I spent cleaning up the backside of the engine, the shock, the suspension linkage, and the exhaust because it was just caked in road debris and tar and sand and rocks. I mean, it it's, blows my mind that Ducati didn't put a hugger of some sort on this bike from the factory. So if you go looking for rear huggers for the 848, 1098, 1198 series of motorcycles, you'll see that there's a lot of options out there. They range from a very stubby hugger that does literally nothing, to one that's a mid-size one that does virtually nothing, to one that's an extra long one that covers half the rear tire that actually does something. So can you guess which one I bought? That's right, it's in the name of the channel, Practical Enthusiast. So I bought the long rear hugger because I'd actually like dirt to stop collecting on the engine. So this is a nice carbon fiber piece made by Tech Carbon. It is a little pricey at $165 shipped, but I think it'll pay dividends once it actually is preventing dirt from going all over the backside of the engine. It's a nicely formed piece, very rigid no pinholes finish obviously is a glossy finish it looks really sharp and i think it will look great once it's on the bike now unfortunately this doesn't come with mounting hardware so i had to go locate some hardware separately and i found these really sweet looking titanium machined bolts i kind of splurged on this for three bolts i paid 24 dollars, but you know what i already paid 165 bucks what's a little bit more to make it look really nice and finished now unfortunately i found that these don't fit in the hugger itself because they have shoulders on them so i will have to grind the holes out a little bit larger so that these will fit down in there better that's the problem usually with carbon fiber parts is they need a little bit extra work to actually make them mount up nice and perfect all right so there we go much larger holes i worked my way up to 11 30 seconds bit so i ended up using the drill not a dremel and now this hardware fits Perfectly. Look at that. No play or anything. Now on the other side, you can see that the shoulder is flush with the panel itself, so this shouldn't be wobbly, it should be held in place nicely. So to actually install this panel in the swing arm, we have to remove these little plugs. And under these plugs are 
threads that you can actually screw into. Now these two aren't a problem, but this one back here by the exhaust, that one's gonna be a bear. I'm not gonna record this because I know it's gonna be struggle bus all the way, and I'm just gonna get it done as best I can. So that is the hugger installed, and man, it does look really, really nice. It really completes the rear end of this bike, and it prevents rocks from getting into that spot. You can see those titanium bolts fit nicely. This bolt is a little hard to get to, but you just get an Allen key in there and it works just fine. There we are. It is all put together. New windscreen really fits the lines pretty well. That hugger looks pretty natural there. Let's do the thing we've all been waiting for. Start it up and make sure it works. I'll also get to see how these new battery cables help the engine start. So it is completely cold. Here we go. I'd say that starts significantly better. It almost starts up with the same speed as a Japanese four-cylinder now, so certainly worth upgrading the battery cables so you don't wear out that starter clutch or anything else. Now I would love to go out and ride this and get it on video on how it performs, but in fact I've actually already done that and another problem has cropped up that I need to fix before I can really go shoot a video with this bike and that is the voltage regulator. Unfortunately, I was out riding, it threw an error, said battery voltage low with 5.1 error or something like that. And after a little bit of research, it turns out the voltage regulators are definitely an Achilles heel on these bikes. So I'm gonna replace that with a MOSFET regulator and relocate it so it's not right up against the exhaust manifold anymore. So we will do that in the next video. But until then, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys again next time.